Uh, it is an architectural masterpiece. I'm still amazed at the beauty of it every time I go by the high school. Many communities have just precious few true iconic buildings and Mishawaka High School is, I think, the most prominent in the city of Mishawaka. Mishawaka High School is so central to the community. Uh, yes, it's brick, there's concrete, there's structural steel, there's terracotta, but if you can love those things, Mishawaka people do. Matt Rendell, Mishawaka High School class, 2007. This building, the school, has been a part of my life for 35 years. <laughs> I grew up on Gernhardt, right next to the school, and then when I was going into high school, actually, we moved a few blocks away. It's always been a part of my family, right? Like, we would always talk about Mishawaka and, and this building in particular because it goes all the way back in my family generations. On top of it being the place that I, I went to school, it's important to me because of the relationship I had with my grandpa. Uh, my grandpa went to school here, graduated in 1960, went to Purdue for four years, and then came right back uh, to raise his family right across the street and to work here at Mishawaka High School for 16, 17 years before he couldn't anymore. But he and I talked a lot about this profession, about teaching and about public education, how important that was. And we talked about it all the time. The running joke in my family is that we would always be together at every occasion and we'd be sitting <laughs> and talking about the things that were important to us. And that was education and that was our family and that was our family history. My family history mirrors that of so many others in and around the city of Mishawaka. Generations have come through the Mishawaka public school system and all of them flow through Mishawaka High School. My great grandma, uh, Mary Castleman, graduated in 1934 from Mishawaka High School. And then her brother, Harry Castleman, graduated in 1932. My great great grandpa, who was Carl Castleman, he was the mayor of Mishawaka from 1939 to 1943, before he passed in the 40s. Would be my grandpa and my grandma on my mom's side. So they both graduated in 1960. My grandpa, Augie Batesel, 1960. My grandma, Roberta Campbell, 1960. My grandpa had one brother, Brad, uh, and he graduated in 1958. My grandma had two sisters. Peggy graduated in 1958 and Jackie who graduated in 1956. Last generation, let's go through my mom's family. Uh, with my mom's family, we'll start with my mom, the oldest, graduated in 1982. My Aunt Diane graduated in 1984. My Aunt Cheryl graduated in 1985. My Aunt Susie, 1986. And then my Uncle Brian graduated in 1988. So they span the 80s there. My dad's family is the same time. So my dad graduated in 19... 83, my Aunt Sherry graduated in 1982 with my mom, and my Aunt Diane on my dad's side graduated in 1989, right? I graduated in 2007, and I had my, my three siblings. Becca, my sister, graduated in 2011. Jacob, my brother, graduated in 2009. And then my older brother, Josh, graduated in 2006. So that was all of us within, within a few years. The, the graduates from this building go back to the early 30s, uh, but it's, it's a lot more than that, right? This building stands for kind of the whole city. My grandfather um, graduated in 1927. He played on the 1927 mythical state football champions. The next graduate would have been my mom, I think 1956. She graduated from Mishawaka High School. Myself then in 1974, my wife 1975, and my sister 1976. And then my son Scott was the class of uh, 2001, and my daughter was the class of 2004. That building has been a part of my family 
for longer than I was born. In fact, my grandparents went there to the same building. My parents went to the same building. When I was a child, I could look out my bedroom window and see that building. It's instantly recognizable. It is, in many ways, the image of our community. It has educated most of our community. And um, as I travel around the state of Indiana, which I do quite a bit, uh, there is none that I have seen that is more beautiful and more um, just uh, true symbolic of the community as Mishawaka High School. And it's a building that I love and uh, just gives me to this day great comfort every time I go past it. Mishawaka High School has been a central part of the lives of Mishawakans for the last 100 years. A meeting place of sorts to gather, support the cavemen, and strengthen the bonds between the generations. Being in Steel Stadium, um, as well as being in the cave, that's an experience that binds the generations. Um, the fact that you can point to uh, going to games, or, or knowing that your, your grandparents or great-grandparents may have gone to games in either of those facilities. And I think about the times I've spent with my family there, my dad and I, uh, gosh, we probably went to hundreds of basketball games in the cave, football games at Steel Stadium, my mom uh, as well. Um, and then we've we tried bringing my nieces. Uh, we have, I have three young nieces. They love going to Mishawaka games, uh, both in the cave and in Steel Stadium. So that's, that's part of the legacy of being in our community, is going to those games, supporting that team, and by extension, supporting your city. Um, even if somebody no longer has children at Mishawaka High School or if they didn't attend Mishawaka High School but they just live in, in the city, when that team runs out on the field and they've got our city's name on their jerseys, that's our team. So, how did this building come to be? What changes were made over the generations to keep it both historically relevant and modern? Let's go back to 1924. The current Mishawaka High School building has been a staple of the community since it was built, spanning from its inception in 1924 to its 100th anniversary in 2024. The current building is really the result of Mishawaka's booming population in the 1920s. We had outgrown the building that was built in 1869. That was replaced with a building in 1910, which still stands and then the population continued to grow. So by the early 1920s, they realized that um, the site where the 1910 building was, that block, uh, there was no way for expansion there. They couldn't add another wing onto that building. So they look at uh, an entirely different site. And so they choose one about a mile east of downtown Mishawaka, which at the time was considered a remote site. It was controversial. People didn't like the idea of having to go a mile from downtown uh, to go to the high school. Uh, and so ultimately, the PC Emmons, who was the superintendent, uh, he won out in that debate and that site was chosen and the high school was built. In September 1924, the doors of Mishawaka High School opened for the first time, boasting a state-of-the-art facility at a cost of $750,000. Equipped with classrooms, laboratories, and study halls, it set the stage for generations of learning. The building was dedicated to the community on September 11, 1924 with the laying of the 1924 cornerstone. This cornerstone acts as a time capsule and includes a school calendar from 1924, a list of enrolled students, the all told, and much more. And we know that it was ready uh, for students. Uh, September 8th, 1924 was the first day. Uh, the gym uh, had its first basketball game, December 27th, 1924. And what people don't always realize is that the entire school was not ready um, when classes started in September. So the auditorium, they only started construction on that in the fall of 1924 and it was ready to be dedicated on May 5th, 1925. And believe it or not, the cafeteria wasn't ready 
until May 14th, 1925. But basically they had the, the classrooms ready. And I, I suspect the gym was ready for, for physical education classes in the fall. But classrooms, gym, and then other parts of the building got finished as quickly as they could. The, the location is significant because uh, the neighborhood around it has grown up with Mishawaka High School. And originally that was farmland, that was the edge of town. And the way Mishawaka has evolved is that the area around the high school, which may have been farmland in the early 1920s, quickly became a neighborhood where every lot had a house on it. And so the city of Mishawaka just surrounded that high school, which is really a, a great metaphor for the idea that Mishawaka High School is so central to the community. And of course, at the football games, then it gives you that wonderful backdrop of those houses along Gernhardt, along Linden, um, that you see when you're sitting in those west bleachers. And so Mishawaka High School is not uh, at a remote location anymore. It's not out in the middle of nowhere, uh, like many high schools are. It is right in the heart of Mishawaka, and that too is one of the distinguishing features of the building and its campus. The character of the building, the architectural style, it's the building materials. You don't see buildings built with the materials that, are, that, that make Mishawaka High School so special. It's the bell tower that is, you know, right there, a symbol of Mishawaka. Over the next few years, some basic improvements were made to the building and campus. The football field was used for the first time in 1926. Gold letters spelling out Mishawaka High School were added to the front facade of the building, highlighting the architecture and welcoming guests for decades to come. The first significant change to the Mishawaka High building since it opened in 1924 came in 1931. Gold letters that spelled Mishawaka High School were added to the front of the building below the clock tower. Those letters have long since become an iconic part of the building, and it's difficult to imagine the front of the building without them. Toward the end of the 1930s, the United States government worked with communities to complete construction projects, including the Battelle Rock Garden, the Band Shell, and improvements to Steel Stadium. Uh, the West Concrete Bleachers uh, were put up in 1938, and then the East Bleachers were put up in 1939 and they were completed in time uh, for the beginning of the football season so um, they were playing their games in a stadium in 1939 that had concrete bleachers on both sides and that project was largely financed by the Works Progress Administration uh, they paid much of the cost particularly the labor costs because it was a New Deal work relief program and the largest portion of the cost for such a project would have been labor anyway. And that's what the federal government was trying to emphasize. And the actual dedication for that stadium occurred at the last game of the season. It was in November, a game against Riley. Uh, but they were using the stadium uh, all throughout the 1939 season. And then even in the 38 season, they had half of, the, of that stadium for fans to be using. After the steel stadium stands were complete, the next modernization to the campus was the controversial expansion to the cave. It's a real interesting story. It really starts in uh, February of 1955. Um, there was a committee that was formed, a group of citizens who wanted to advocate for an expanded basketball facility. And it's, it's no coincidence that the basketball team is putting together this great run. They won a bunch of consecutive games in, in early 1955, and ultimately they win the sectional, they win the regional, uh, they go on to what was called the semifinal uh, or semi-state, we would say, championship game. It's the, the deepest run of any Mishawaka basketball team in the state tournament. And the crowds in these home games, for a basketball facility that can officially seat 1,400 and standing room only. I've, I've seen accounts where they refer to 2,000 people being in that old gym. Uh, the fire marshal must have taken the night off because if your seating capacity is 1,400, I don't know how you fit another 600 standing. But those Leroy Johnson years, that's really what we're talking about. Leroy's sophomore year, 
Uh, he was the star of the team in the 55 season. And then they again have great crowds in 56. And then the 57 season, his senior year, every home game is just packed. And that really compels the school board to, to solve the problem. It had become a problem. Uh, this gym that in 1924 was considered spacious. It was the most modern gym in, in the county, good enough to get the sectional for many years. By 1955, it had become this small cracker box <laughs> that, that the opponents hated playing in and simply did not have enough seating. And so they, they considered different options. Uh, I know one option they talked about was building uh, an entirely separate freestanding gymnasium on the site where Northside School later was on McKinley Avenue. That, that site has 40 acres of land. So Mishawaka would have had its north side gym, just like Elkhart had its north side gym that opened in the fall of 1954. Uh, but finally their decision, their solution, was to expand the, the old gym by essentially doubling it and building a mirror image of the original U-shaped gym but extending that out toward the sidewalk along Lincoln Way. And that resulted in uh, a gym that looked very much like the old original gym. Um, even the, the wooden bleachers or the wooden stands in the upper level, um, the exposed steel beams above. And it opened in, the, in November 1958 uh, with a seating capacity of 4,071. And so that remains the oldest active high school gym in the state of Indiana. Uh, it's just, I consider it an engineering marvel. I mean, think about it, doubling your gym, doubling a space like that, that would be like doubling a church. Um, that's just a difficult structure to work with. It's just easier to, to build a new facility, but it may have been more difficult for them to acquire land uh, let's say even on the other side of the high school building, like was done in later years. And so they thought, well, we have this land. We could extend the gym. We don't have to buy up any properties. And it solves our seating problem. And I also like to refer to the current gym um, with, with a nod to Leroy Johnson. It was the success of the teams that he was on and just his own star power uh, as the greatest Mishawaka High School basketball player that really compelled um, that decision to build a new gym. It probably would have happened eventually, um, but it happened when it did in great part because of the success of Leroy Johnson and his teammates. So that's why uh, I refer to that, that gym as the house that Leroy built. Over the years, the names and titles associated with Mishawaka High School have adapted to the changing times. When the concrete stadium opened, it was still called Mishawaka School Field, and then it was named for um, William Tupper, um, who had been a longtime school board member, and that was in the 1940s. Uh, he had retired from the school board. He was still alive when they, they named it Tupper Field. And then in 1980, it was renamed Steele Stadium. Uh, and that was in honor of Frank Steele, who had been the great football coach and athletic director, football coach back in the 1920s and then athletic director after that. And so in 1980, uh, the, the name Tupper Field is completely dropped and it becomes Steele Stadium. And there remains some confusion. I know um, the South Bend Tribune, for example, they. Uh, last fall, they were using the term Tupper Field at Steel Stadium, and that is completely a fiction. The football stadium isn't the only part of Mishawaka High School history with confusion surrounding it. The school's mascot also brings up questions. Maroons and cavemen were being used interchangeably. There may have been some sports where they used maroons more than others, but you find like in basketball and football articles, from the 1940s or 50s, where in the same article, they're using the same, both terms. And finally, in 1968, not sure what the reasoning was or what the process was, but Maroons is retired. And so in the fall of 68 onward, it's cavemen. And, you know, it, it makes sense. Just have one mascot. Yeah. Have one name for your, for your facility and have one mascot. <laughs> 
As the high school is choosing cavemen as their official mascot, more and more students are attending. This increase in student enrollment initiated one of the first major renovations to Mishawaka High School. You know, this is being pushed also by the baby boomers. You know, by the early 60s, they're, they're coming, they're coming to the high school, and so there's a need for more space, more classroom space, and so that addition along Gernhart was really the first uh, major addition involving classrooms to the 1924 building. So those originally would have looked toward Gernhardt and a larger lawn area along uh, the east side of the building. So I know construction was occurring throughout 1963. I think construction began in, in 1963 and they're working through that year. And then it's ready for student use in January of 1964. The Gernhardt addition added much needed classroom space, but also established a unique visual feature to the campus. I think it creates a courtyard because those, the classrooms that are in that part of the building along Gernhardt, by creating those, it, is, it would cause there to be a courtyard because to the west, on the west side of that courtyard, that would have been part of the original 1924 building. Many special events took place at Mishawaka High School over the years, but few have had as lasting an impact as the one in 1973. One of the great moments in the cave's history closed a chapter in Mishawaka's involvement in the Vietnam War. Lieutenant Richard Brenneman, Mishawaka graduate, was shot down by a surface-to-air missile while flying his F-4 Phantom over North Vietnam on November 8, 1967. He was captured and spent 1,954 days as a prisoner of war. On April 7, 1973, now Captain Brenneman returned to Mishawaka for a visit with his family. A thousand people greeted him at the airport and hundreds more cheered as his motorcade went through South Bend and, and Mishawaka to the family home on East 3rd Street. The next day, Mishawaka officially welcomed Brenneman with a community-wide tribute in the gym, an event that was attended by over 2,000 people. After the dignitaries on the platform, platform party were seated, Captain Brenneman entered the gym and was met with a standing ovation that lasted several minutes. The final standing ovation occurred as Brenneman left the gym to um, join a receiving line in front of the high school. And for an hour afterward, he greeted the public as people expressed their well wishes. As the needs of Mishawaka High School changed, so did the building. In 1983, the school board had made the decision to bring the freshmen back to the high school. And that would require additional classroom space. And so there was an addition that was put on on the west side of the building um, that involved uh, classrooms, general classrooms on the second floor, large study hall, and then on the first floor, music classrooms. And so th I think the original plan, what they ideally would have liked to do, would have been to have the gym and the pool be part of that project. But they decided, maybe for budgetary reasons, to separate the projects. And so 1983, that classroom addition is put on, and then in the spring of 1986, construction begins on the gym, the auxiliary gym, and the pool on the west, further west end of the building. So what had been the entrance into a commons area, when I was in high school, that was the, the west edge of the building. And then the construction of the pool and the gym um, extends the building even further to the west, to the present west appearance of, of the building. And uh, so that was really the next major building project of the high school. They, they were separate projects in the sense that they were separated by about three years, but I think the original master plan uh, that they were thinking of back in the 1983 edition would have been ideally at that time to put on the gym and the pool, but uh, they just did so a couple years later. When I came in in 88, they were just finishing the West Wing. Actually, the pool wasn't done 
the gym wasn't done, the commons, they had the commons ready. Um, so I, I got to see that transition, uh, of course the tech wing. The next major phase of construction and enhancement to the building was building a science and technology wing. And of course some of this is driven by the changing nature of technology, but also the science facilities prior to the construction of that wing had really been inadequate. I know, at least when I was in school there, the third floor was the science department. And you know, those poor teachers, they suffered up there and in an era before uh, air conditioning in the building. And just those classrooms were not made to be modern science labs. And so again, to School City's credit, they said, we have to address this situation. So it actually involved demolition of part of the, the, the building there, that uh, northwest wing of the building closest to the football stadium. And then construction of a two-story, uh, complete two-story facility that would have technology rooms, science rooms, and then a new television uh, studio uh, in the basement. And again, that's part of keeping the building viable rather than saying, you know, well, this is part of the 1924 building. We, we can't bear to part with this. We just have to make do. Um, School City said, hey, we, we have to do this for our students. And that's especially the case with science and technology. English, as, as a former English teacher, I can tell you, I, I could teach English in any classroom. Just give me overhead lighting, and that's all I need. Um, but science and technology and television production require different kinds of demands, and the facilities have to be up to par for that. So that was a real uh, important enhancement to the building and basically has completed the structure. Adding on to the 1924 building has extended the viability of Mishawaka High School, modernizing a historic structure to keep up with the changing times. Community support as well as innovative ideas kept Mishawaka from bulldozing history. Uh, there was talk about well, where would we build a new Mishawaka High School and yeah, it, it's unthinkable because <clears throat> that building is so much a part of the fabric of Mishawaka, uh, the city of Mishawaka. And, and so many people, tens of thousands of graduates have had their lives connected to that building that it is the most significant building in the city and its preservation and continued usability should be the single highest priority when it comes to facilities and buildings of any kind in the city of Mishawaka. Improvements continue inside and outside the school, but the campus improvements have helped to beautify the look of the 100-year-old building. And then having the statue of the cheerleader, the spirit of Mishawaka, you know, what a wonderful addition and of course that's the legacy of Rosemary Clare's generosity, and how many schools, high schools, have statues at their football stadium or any of their athletic facilities. Major League Baseball, the NFL, that's a real common thing to have statues for your, your great players, um, but to have a cheerleader who embodies this spirit of love and pride that we have toward Mishawaka High School, that is the perfect thing for that space. More recently, another new statue sits on the MHS campus, this time at the newly appointed main entrance to the building. Because now that's sort of the main entrance to Mishawaka High School, all of our opponents coming in that west entrance, whether it's to a basketball game or volleyball or, or, or even swimming, they're gonna be greeted by this, this huge caveman mascot, and where else on earth can you find a statue of a caveman? Yeah. But you'll fi you find it here yeah. at Mishawaka High School. Mishawaka High School embodies the blend of old and new, including a new feature added in 2018 to Steel Stadium. We have the best electronic sign of any high school that I've seen us play at. Nobody's even close to it. And uh, even Penn, you know, they haven't, uh, you know, they haven't uh, decided to try to replicate or surpass uh, Mishawaka's electronic signs. So that's like our thing now. The, the, that dichotomy or that connection between this very modern sign and behind it is that 1924 clock tower. 
and uh, that, that original 1924 school building um, you know, just shows that we have one foot in the past and one foot in the present and, and pointing to the future. Many communities are you know, quick to tear down and build a new community and I think it says something that Mishawaka has continued to improve and upgrade and utilize their historic high school. Uh, I think it says a lot about where we've come from but also says a lot about where we're going. I'm proud of the fact that Mishawaka has seen the historical benefit of keeping it and um, it, it still looks grand. It's just a wonderful beautiful building. I think the beauty of what they've done over these years is every time they they made a change or they added on it didn't disrupt the character um which would be so easy to do today but they you know they would use the same terracotta they use the same brick um everything architecturally was just spot on no matter how beautiful the building is nothing compares to its most important attribute the people in mishawaka high school uh, that building is certainly the most significant building uh, in the city because of the product that has come out of that building. These 30,000 plus graduates that have gone into uh, their lives, their adult lives here in Mishawaka and, and in other communities around the country. And if that's the product that comes out of Mishawaka High School, that's more significant than any product that came off the ball band shoe line or any of their other um, production lines or anything that came out of Dodge or, or Bendix. And so that's another way to look at uh, Mishawaka High School and its significance is not just th this wonderful building that is the most attractive building in, in the city, um, but the people whose lives have been shaped by that building. Uh, that's its real significance. And so the future of Mishawaka High School needs to always be mindful of how can we continue to positively and significantly impact the lives of the students who pass through that school and on into their adult lives. Um, that's the real priority. I want to make sure that my students know that education is, and especially public education is so important for you to learn about things that are going to help you or things that help you see the world but most importantly that they matter that students in our our schools matter and that we're going to be here every day to make sure that they're okay we go through hard things and you know students talk to me all the time about the hard things they're going through because they feel safe because they know that they can come here and that, that somebody cares. And it's not always serious. It's about their boyfriends or girlfriends. It's about uh, their jobs or it's about, you know, how they performed at whatever, right? Music or sports or art or whatever. But it's, it's what I believe is so important about public education, that we're gonna be here for a hundred years and we're gonna be here for a hundred more and it's free and public and for everybody. Uh, it doesn't matter what your IEP says. It doesn't matter what your 504 plan says. It doesn't matter if you speak English or not. It doesn't matter. We're gonna be here to serve you as, as a, a school and as a community. And so what this building stands for here is that it's been here and continues, right? We, we have a lot of things that change. Things inside the building, we add on to the building, we change stuff for the future but it continues to stand. And this building has stood for 100 years and has served this community, right? The building was built with nothing around it. And now it's, the house is everywhere. And it's, it's so, so ingrained into the Mishawaka community. It's so iconic to what the, the city is that we want to continue that happening. Uh, and for me, this building stands for what public education is all about. Being here continuously for years and years and years, serving our community for years and years and years, and having to adapt to the world around us, to our community. Our community is changing all the time, and we have to adapt to that, and that's what I hope we can do.